Everyone has their own little hobby. Some people like making crafts. Others like collecting coins. Mine is breaking into houses. Or, I guess I should say, was. And I was good at it too. Very good, in fact. I started out small, slowly built up my skills, and then graduated to the big time. If one does that, you tend to learn a few things. For starters, never ever wear a ski mask. It screams that you're up to no good. It makes you beyond conspicuous. Definitely a no-no when you're trying to stay incognito and fly under the radar. Robbing a gas station is completely different from pulling off some Ocean Eleven's style heist, which is the difference between burglary and robbery. A robbery requires a brute force, while a burglary is pure calculation. I've never done a stick-up job, and I never will. If there is one thing you can't be to be a successful burglar, it's sloppy. And robbing some convenience store is nothing but risky and sloppy. Maximum risk for minimum reward. Which is why you always choose your targets wisely. But in this day and age, choosing a target is made far easier by social media. People love posting pictures of all their latest overpriced gizmos and gadgets. And that's just the start of it. If you do your homework, you could easily piece together someone's entire routine just from the stuff they tweet or post on Facebook. And in fact, you might see updates about going on vacation, what time their flight is, and when they'll be back. And since people love nothing more than to post pictures of their pets, it's not hard to find who owns a dog you don't want to stumble across. All the joys of the age that we live in. And it's not enough for some people to own a yacht or whatever. They have to constantly remind you that they own it. But with all that self-aggrandizement comes plenty of opportunity from interested parties like me. With habits like that, there's no need to case a house for days on end. As an interior designer, that gives me plenty of opportunity to check out houses and become familiar with neighborhoods. On top of that, being a woman is most definitely an advantage. People are far more likely to be suspicious of a man hanging around a neighborhood than a woman who is 5'3". If there is one thing I always take pride in, it's the fact that I never burglarized anyone who didn't have it coming. I have no interest in stealing some poor family's piggy bank or a set of pearls belonging to some little old lady. And I never snatched anyone's college fund or retirement money. No, I prefer to go after the rich big shots, especially if they're a total sleaze. It's not that I'm trying to be Robin Hood or something. There's just no reward or fun in stealing from a regular person. No challenge. Any dumbass can, and usually does, try to rob the local 7-Eleven. But successfully breaking into someone's house without them realizing it takes some effort and planning. So, if you're going to break into someone's house, it better be worth it. My last job was not worth it. My last job was Frank Robinson, a local rich guy. He lived in a beautiful colonial-style mansion situated right on a lake. I had periodically driven through the area when I found out that Robinson would be heading out of town for a business trip. On the whole, I definitely prefer to carry out my little hobby in the daytime for a variety of reasons. But since Robinson had people watching the house during the daytime, that meant I had no other choice but to work at night. My boyfriend Paul was busy visiting his brother out of state, so I was at least free for the evening. Carefully parking my car a ways away, I silently locked it and crept towards the house, the trees casting shadows everywhere. With each step, the adrenaline that always joins me on a job grew louder, almost like a Geiger counter. There was no front gate, so that made things easier. Taking care to walk casually towards the backyard, I scanned the house to decide how I would enter. It didn't take long to decide on a first floor window. Putting on my gloves, I made quick work of the window and carefully moved and lowered the blinds out of the way 
before quietly shutting the window. With this done, I switched on my flashlight and was greeted by the typical atmosphere of a climate-controlled McMansion. Hardwood floors, winding banisters, and the telltale scent of a few overpriced candles. A quick check revealed there to be no alarm system, which was no surprise. Usually if people have alarm systems, they love to advertise it. The trick when looking through a super rich person's house is that they will never hide their most valuable stuff in plain sight. Constantly showing it off on the internet is one thing, but when it comes to storing it, most times they'll stop at nothing to find the best hiding spots. Hidden rooms are a favorite. Not only do they provide a good hiding spot, but they also make great panic rooms, a two-for-one deal. Walking past the front sitting room, I noticed the presence of a gleaming piano. I shot my flashlight under the lid to make sure that there was nothing hiding inside. It was empty. Wasting no more time in that room, I slowly crept up the winding stairs to the second floor. I always prefer being on the second floor of McMansions because there's usually a huge window overlooking the driveway, which makes it far easier to spot someone. And if need be, I can always make my escape via a window since I enjoy rock climbing and typically go once a week. Past the hallways at cream colored carpet, there is an open set of double doors that lead to the master suite. Aside from a large canopy bed with black sheets, there is a gleaming mahogany chest of drawers. Adjusting the flashlight so it was facing downwards, I began opening drawers. Excellent. There is some jewelry and some expensive watches which included a few Rolexes. I carefully tucked one Rolex into my bag, in keeping with another one of my rules, never getting carried away. The trick to never getting caught is not letting the owner realize that someone was here. Closing the chest up, I moved to the closet. Aside from the nice clothes, the only thing of interest there were a few sets of expensive cufflinks. I selected a single cufflink to studied with a sapphire before making my way to the study, which was across the hallway. Aside from the expensive laptop sitting on a glass desk, there was nothing of value in here. Leaving the study, I headed back down the stairs, briefly passed by the spacious kitchen, and was doing one final sweep when I found the door to the basement. Grabbing the doorknob, I twisted it open and shine my flashlight down into the looming darkness. I love basements. It's usually the most interesting room in any house, as it's the one place people feel most free to be themselves, since usually no one ever goes down there except for the people that live there. The living rooms are beyond dull. Nothing but furniture people rarely sit on, and family photos where at least one person looks awkward. Basements are also where some of the most interesting things are stored. Or at least, most basements are interesting. This basement, like the rest of the house, was boring. The space was dedicated to workout equipment, which included plenty of weights and an exercise bike. I was nearly finished looking around when I noticed a large bookcase filled with books. Going all the way from the floor to the ceiling, it was made of dark wood. It was lovely to look at but it was also completely out of place down here. Gently prodding it, I thought I could feel something on the other side. Giddiness washed over me when I realized that I was looking at a secret passage. I gently tugged on it and the bookcase began to come away from the wall, which continued until it was completely pulled back to reveal a narrow hallway about half the size of the bookcase. The passage was pitch black with no lighting but my flashlight revealed the walls were bare with bits of insulation, framework, plywood, and wires showing. Since I had no idea where this led, I kept my flashlight aimed at the floor while I took a step into the passageway, my feet quietly hitting the makeshift carpet. After a few steps down into the narrow corridor, the passage turned to the left and opened up to a nook-sized room, large enough to hold a few people. There was a dangling light bulb hanging overhead, but I stuck to my flashlight. 
When I saw what this room held, I didn't want to touch a thing. The room was mostly a series of ordinary shelves and tables, but what was on them was anything but normal. There were massive piles of money in various denominations, but I spotted thick stacks of 20, 50, and $100 bills bound together by rubber bands. But what really got my attention were the thick parcels everywhere that seemed to be bulging. Most of these were in packaging about the size of a brick that was impossible to see what was inside. But from some small bags that were clear plastic, I could see exactly what was inside. There is no telling how much money and drugs alone this room held. I felt myself exhale deeply, as I hadn't even realized I was holding my breath. There was not a chance I was touching this money. There are things not worth stealing, and this is the number one thing not worth taking. Backing out of the room, I could feel my hands sweating under my gloves as I closed the passage up and went upstairs. Moving quicker, but not in a panic, I began replacing the few items that I had commandeered. I had just finished putting stuff back in the bedroom and was walking down the stairs when I heard it. The unmistakable sound of a car outside and footsteps approaching the front door. Crap. It was every burglar's worst nightmare. An unexpected arrival. Ignoring the deafening pounding in my heart, I discreetly peeked out the bottom of the window in the sitting room with the piano. I could faintly make out the shape of several people walking towards the house. With panic now flooding through my body, I crept over to the huge black couch beside the window that I had just looked through and I ducked behind it. There was no time for anything else. The couch was on the left side of the house and was positioned at an angle so that the couch's front was facing the hallway. Just as I had settled down into my makeshift hiding spot, the sound of the front door being unlocked filled the room. It was without a doubt the most terrifying sound I had ever heard. With one hand clasped tightly over my mouth, my body froze in position as I watched the front door slowly open and three men walked in. It's back this way, said the first one in a gruff voice after closing the front door shut. I couldn't tell what he looked like, but my mind imagined him as tall and in good shape. The garage, right? A slightly higher voice asked quietly. That's right, in the freezer, the first voice replied. They didn't say another word, but I heard them walk away from this part of the house and towards the kitchen, their shoes making telltale noises on the floor as they walked. I sat there quietly my heart still thudding away in my chest, only slightly less frenzied than before. What were they here for? What could they possibly be getting from the garage when the stuff that I would have thought they came for was in the basement? From the far side of the house, I heard the door to the garage open for the sound of it shutting followed after a few moments. I mentally kicked myself for not looking in the garage. What was in there? A few minutes later, I heard the sound of a door close and I decided to go for it. Carefully looking around the edge of the couch to make sure the coast was clear, I crept towards the window and peered out of the bottom to check the driveway. All three men were now outside by the car that they had come in. I had no idea what they had gotten from the garage, but at least they were outside now. From the looks of it, they had just put something in the back of the car and were about to pile in. Two of them had their backs to me, and they were talking to a third, who I couldn't see. A moment later, one of them turned and I got a look at the third man. When I did, my blood turned to ice. There, talking to two strange men in the middle of the night, when he should have been out of town, was Paul, my boyfriend. I crouched there silently while Paul and the other two guys got in the car. There was no way I would be able to get to my car in time to follow them, so I waited until they backed out of the driveway before I snapped a picture of the car and the license plate. As they pulled away, I had no idea what to do or think. What the hell was going on? But no matter what, 
Calling the police was out of the question. What was I going to tell them? Oh, hi, I broke into someone's house in the middle of the night and while stealing stuff, I saw my boyfriend come in with two strangers and take something from the garage and go somewhere else. No, I was very much on my own here. The house was silent again, but this time all it did was make me more paranoid. What else was here that I didn't know about? After a moment I stood up, my limbs aching from the way that I had been crouching. There was one thing I had to do for sure. So I picked up my flashlight to turn it back on and made my way to the garage. On the way, I briefly took off my gloves and let my hands get some air, since they were now damp with sweat. After some effort, I found myself standing in the front of the door to the garage, both curious and on edge to see what was inside. I grabbed the door with a gloved hand and gingerly pushed it open. My flashlight threw the granite steps descending from the floor into relief. I took the three steps with a caution, not wanting to fall or miss anything. From the looks of it, the garage was completely normal. There was nothing out of the ordinary in sight and nothing that said something sinister was at work. There were no ominous stains anywhere, no signs of a fight, not even signs that anything had been cleaned up. But that didn't make me feel better. Three men don't just show up at a house where money and drugs are being hidden in the middle of the night and remove something from the garage unless something has gone down. But what? Either way, it was time for me to get out of here now. I walked back into the house and shut the garage door before retracing my steps and heading to the same window that I came in through. I eased myself out just fine and made sure to gently shut the window before carefully walking away. Mindful of not walking too fast or too slow. I wasted no time in ripping my gloves off for good and stuffing them into my pocket, my hands clammy and damp. As I walked to my car, I was extra careful to pay attention to my surroundings, which meant that I was hyper alert to every sound I thought I heard and every motion I thought I saw. The walk back to my car after a job had never seemed so ominous before. My nerves were gnawing away at me, and by the time I saw my black sedan, I was almost giddy with relief. I quickly made sure the coast was clear, before piling into the driver's seat and starting it up. After I was sure that the only sound inside was my own heavy breathing, I was beyond relief to pull out of the neighborhood and onto the road. By the time I had reached the light to get on the highway, my breathing had eased out and I felt exhausted. Tonight had seemed like an eternity. Now that I was on the road and back in my element, I could think. What was Paul up to? He was supposed to be out of town for a few days, so that meant whatever he was up to, odds were good that his presence would be required elsewhere in the next day or so, and not just for whatever he had been up to tonight. I suppose that meant that I should pay his place a visit if he wasn't there. I would put my skills to use and search his place, but for tonight, I needed to go home and get some rest. My adrenaline had crashed and I was beat. Definitely not the best shape to go snooping around your boyfriend's apartment. The rest of the drive home was mercifully uneventful, and before too long, my condo building was in sight. But I didn't truly feel normal again until I got into the tenant-only parking garage and pulled into my spot. I had never been so happy to see the door seal shut behind me. I lumbered up to my apartment, and when the deadbolt was securely in place, I changed and fell into bed. Sleep was fitful. I woke up late and after eating a good-sized breakfast, I drove to Paul's place. When I arrived at the red brick bungalow, I saw that Paul's car was nowhere in sight. In fact, there were no cars at all in the driveway. I checked to make sure that the coast was clear before I parked my car a good ways away and approached the house. I knew where the spare key was, so I didn't even have to go through my usual trouble. But just to be on the safe side, I went through the motions of knocking on the door like I was expecting him, but there was no response to my knocks or calling his name. When there was only silence, 
I grabbed the spare key under the potted plant in the porch and let myself into the garage. I never go through the front if I can help it. The garage was empty, aside from the usual clutter. Since I had no idea when he would be back, that meant I had to hurry. I wasn't looking for anything specific, anything that might be a clue to what was going on. I unlocked the door connecting the house and garage and I pushed my way inside. The laundry room, the room closest to the garage, looked the same as always. The kitchen, TV room, and dining room were also normal. Nothing out of the ordinary was lying around, and everything looked perfectly normal. A quick glance revealed the living room looked as dull as usual, and the closet near the front door held nothing that I hadn't seen before. So I made my way upstairs to check the bedroom and the master bathroom. Nothing unusual there either. I was walking back down the stairs when I remembered there was one room left. The basement. For some reason, the memory of what I had found last night washed over me, and I dreaded the thought of exploring this basement. After some effort, I found myself staring at the door to the basement, but my arm suddenly felt like it weighed a thousand pounds. I took a deep breath and I saw my arm reach out, open the door, and darkness greeted me. Much like the basement last night, there were no windows here either. I didn't bring my flashlight with me, but I didn't have to. Since I didn't want to touch the light switch, I got my phone out and I used that light instead. My phone illuminated the basement's seven red carpeted steps as I descended them. What lay beyond them was pitch black. Once I had reached the basement floor, I took my time looking around. The light from my phone skimmed over the basement's contents, some workout equipment to TV, the usual collection of storage tubs, furniture and boxes. Nothing out of the ordinary here either. Somehow I felt both relieved and let down. Either way, it was time to go. I was careful to lock up and leave everything the exact same way I left it before casually walking down the street and returning to my car. When I got it started and began the drive back home, I tried to think of what to do next. Try to be in the keyword. With nothing left to do, I decided to go home and get rest when I heard my phone go off. My stomach sank like a brick when I saw Paul's name, but I took a deep breath and forced myself to calm down before answering. Hey there, I said happily, like there was no one else I would rather be talking with. May you? Paul answered in his usual sunny tone. You miss me? No, not at all. I'm having the time of my life without you. Ah, very funny. What about you? You having a good time? It's decent. You know how family can be. That I do. I would much rather spend the night with you at the cabin. That would be nice. So, what are you up to tonight? Oh, nothing special. I'll just make myself something easy for dinner, and maybe watch some TV. And you? Something similarly dull. Shall I let you go? I just wanted to check in and make sure everything was okay. You know that's always appreciated and sure. I'm just gonna watch some TV and relax. Well, enjoy yourself. And stay out of trouble. Same goes for you. Thanks. Here's a kiss for me. And one to you. And with that, the call ended. I felt relief flood through me that it was over. Paul sounded just like his old self. I had no idea what that meant. I stifled a yawn and was about to get off the highway when I realized it. He said he wishes he was at the cabin. As in, his family's cabin deep in the country woods where there's no one around for miles. A shiver ran up my spine as I remembered it. I had been there before. It was beautiful, but it was a way out there. Not another house for miles. If you wanted to hide something, it was the perfect place to do it. The perfect place to do almost anything, in fact. As much as I wanted to go right now, I knew I should wait until the sun went down. If I had to hide in the woods for some reason, 
or avoid being detected in general, then it would be far easier at night. So I went home and tossed a frozen pizza in the oven. I was surprisingly hungry and chowed down before I took a long nap on the couch after watching some TV. When I woke up, dusk had begun to fall. I took my time changing into something dark before I headed out for the cabin. It was at least an hour and a half away, so by the time I hit the road, it was already nighttime. The lights of the city receded into the background as my car was swallowed up by trees. The moon was full and the light shined through the dense tree limbs that seemed to be everywhere. The white surface looming large, like it was silently watching what I was up to. It never ceases to amaze me how much more ominous something like this feels at night. As I got close to the cabin, I could feel the adrenaline rising, almost crackling in the air like electricity. If there was anything to be found, it had to be here. First, I would discreetly drive past the house to see what it looked like, and then if all was clear, I would drive a ways down the road by the dense brush, park and take a closer look. I passed the large open field that was the telltale sign I was getting close, so I switched off my headlights. My body was taut, ready to go. I kept driving at a slower, more casual pace as I prepared to pass the cabin, which was on the right side of the road. From the looks of it, no one was home. There were no indoor lights on and there were no cars in the driveway, though that didn't exclude the one-car garage. Everything looked quiet and the cabin was surrounded by darkness. So far, so good. That meant I could proceed with parking my car a ways away, which I successfully did down by a large cluster of pine trees. Shutting the door quietly, I crept towards the cabin, with my flashlight in hand but not turned on, approaching from the side as opposed to the front or back. There was not a car on the road and everything was silent as I walked through the dense trees surrounding the cabin. Each step involved stepping through a mess of fallen branches. Fortunately, the ground was dry so I didn't have to worry about making muddy footprints inside if I got that far. But each step brought a fresh pang of nerves, and I didn't want to make any noise in. The faintest sound in the darkness beyond now seemed far louder than normal. I was constantly looking around me, with no clue what was out there. Slowly but surely, I got closer to the house. It had always seemed so cozy and inviting, but now I dreaded the thought of going inside. But since I didn't even have a spare key, that didn't seem like it would be a concern. I carefully scaled the place from a distance to get a feel for if anything was different, taking care to stay inside the perimeter of dense trees that shielded me from view. On the outside, the cabin was the same as last time I was here. But without warning, light came streaming outside onto the back porch from the inside, as the inside dining room was now illuminated. My heart leapt about a foot inside my chest as I crouched down and tried to see what caused it. Peering through some thick spruce branches, I saw someone inside the kitchen with their back turned to the sliding glass doors, the backyard, and to me. It was Paul. It now occurred to me that he was probably staying out here the entire time. But why? There had to be some reason he lied about going to visit his family showed up with some random guys to get something at someone's house in the middle of the night, and was staying here out of all places. Now I could see that Paul was pacing back and forth, and when he turned a moment later, I could see he was on the phone. I had no idea what he was saying, but he didn't look pleased at all. Fortunately at that moment, what had been my previous biggest pet peeve about Paul kicked in, and he stepped outside with a cigarette and a lighter, he had promised me countless times that he was quitting. Well, I guess it wasn't the only thing he had been straight with me about. He held the phone to his ear with his shoulder as he put the cigarette in his mouth and lit it before taking a drag. No, I understand, he said after blowing out a puff of smoke. It wouldn't be long before I could smell it from here. We did what we promised. It's out of our hands now. Are they sure someone broke in? My entire body went numb with the question. 
There was silence while whoever spoke on the other line. They don't know for sure, huh? Was anything taken? Another drag on the cigarette. Then how do you know someone besides us was there? Paul flicked the ash off his cigarette. The smell of cigarette smoke faintly registered to me, but I was too tense to process it. I don't buy that. He's paranoid. Always has been and always will be. You know that too. Everything was just fine when we got there. He's just looking for a reason to complain. So, someone needs to talk him off the ledge. I'm calling it tonight, Chief, so I'll talk to you later. Paul took one last drag before casting the butt on the ground and stopping it out with his shoe. And then without taking so much as they look back, he went inside, turned out the light, and all was quiet. I didn't move for a few minutes after the lights went out, and even then, it was hesitant at first, moving cautiously away from the cabin, deeper into the trees. Someone, most likely the homeowner, had believed someone other than Paul and his associates had been in the house. But Paul didn't believe it, and it looked like someone else didn't either. And there was absolutely no sign anything had been taken, so that was something to be happy about. The walk back to my car took forever. By the time I reached it, I was exhausted and wanted nothing more than to go home and take a shower. Once I was safely on the road, I decided that, once home, I would take a shower, have a drink or two with some dessert, and then go to bed. A fresh brownie or two sounded fantastic, as the last time that I had baked something like that was about two months ago. Around the time Paul asked me if I could hold on to that box for him. The blood stopped cold in my veins at the memory. Paul had asked me if he could keep a box in my place because they were renovating his house and that's why we had spent time in the cabin. So I said yes without a thought, and the box had been on the top shelf of my closet ever since, completely untouched. Time to change that. My exhaustion faded away as I drove home. I kept clenching and unclenching the steering wheel, as if that could make the drive go faster. Flipping through the radio channels didn't help either. Finally, the lights of the city were on the horizon, and I drove as fast as I could back home. After taking these stairs two at a time, I tried to walk quietly down the hallway so I didn't disturb anyone before I shoved the key in the lock and I barged into my condo. Once I had relocked the door, I flipped on the lights and I opened the closet door. My eyes immediately found the large wooden box that had been there all this time unopened. I picked it up with caution. It was huge but not really heavy. Regardless, I put it down with care before removing the lid, which wasn't locked. Once this was done, I could see what was inside. From the looks of it, the box held a bunch of random knickknacks. I took each thing out of the box so I could study it. There were a bunch of framed photographs of Paul and his family, an old baseball, several old t-shirts, and a few other items that were worth nothing but sentimental value. But for some reason, the box's interior looked off like the space inside didn't match the size. I tilted the box onto its side and poked at the bottom for a moment until it fell out and something clattered around. I took out the false bottom and lowered my head to get a closer look at what was inside. A key ring with a single key attached to it, along with a tag, which had the name and address of a storage facility just outside of the city limits on it. There is also a number of a specific unit. Unit 17. It wasn't far from here at all. So I went back to the garage and headed out again. The facility wasn't far from me at all, but in the darkness, the storage facility was creepy as hell. There were a few of those generic security lights, but they gave the place an eerie orange glow in spots. Parking just in front of Unit 17, I grabbed the key and I walked towards the door, my shoes crunching on the gravel. I hated being out here. I felt exposed and kept looking around to make sure that I was alone. I tucked my flashlight under my arm 
while I fiddled with the key in the lock. It opened with a satisfying click, and I pushed the metallic door open. I silently hoped that the noise wouldn't draw any unwanted attention. I shoved the key into my pocket and switched on my flashlight, which illuminated the unit's contents. It was a veritable gold mine, with expensive items located everywhere you looked. Boxes held jewelry made of every conceivable metal and jewel. Highbrow artwork shielded in plastic. A shiny antique desk gleamed in the light of my flashlight, and mint condition first edition books were just some of the finds I saw at my first glance. But why were they kept out here in a storage unit that Paul had a key to stashed away? A key hidden in a box that he gave me to keep. I was about to turn away and go back to the car when I saw it. An expensive painting located near the back of the unit. I recognized the elegant watercolor of the wilderness as belonging to the Fells, a very nice and incredibly rich family that I had done design work for. The whole bunch of them had vanished without a trace one night and had never been seen again. Looking at it made my blood turn to ice. They were a nice family and they didn't deserve what had happened to them at all. I took another look at the items in the unit. Something else caught my attention. Another painting near the back depicted a beautiful woman from centuries ago. I immediately recognized the owner as Charlotte Cunningham, a local philanthropist who had also vanished without a trace. She was on holiday in the island somewhere at the time. The painting had hung in her dining room when I last saw it. Looking at it here made my stomach sink for multiple reasons. For starters, a beautiful masterpiece like that should be in a gallery or a museum, not stashed away in some cement and metal storage facility. The only reason somebody would keep something like that here is if they're trying to hide it, most likely because they acquired it through unconventional means. I should know. Since every instinct in my body was screaming to call the police, I stepped out of the unit and took one more look at it in full, before doing just that. My flashlight gleamed off something near the left corner. It was a collection of jewelry, a ring, a diamond necklace, a bracelet, and earrings, all studded with rubies and kept together in a box. The last time I had seen that was when it was worn by Mary Jo Warren, who, with her husband, Charles Warren, used to have a home here that I helped design. Like others, the Warrens had also disappeared without a trace. I grabbed my phone and I dialed the police, who arrived a little while after I had explained how I found a key in something that my boyfriend had gave me. For good measure, I added that I thought he was cheating on me, and that's why I was suspicious. When they arrived, I also showed the text from Paul saying that he was out of town. After some digging, the cops found out that everything in the unit had been taken from people who had suspiciously vanished without a trace. By asking relatives and friends, they also found out that all the unit's contents had vanished right around the time the people who owned them had failed to turn up. It's far easier stealing from someone who has vanished without a trace before anyone knows they're missing, especially if you're the only one who knows they're missing. Paul, my now ex-boyfriend, was part of a massive group that was trafficking in rare valuables. They're not sure yet if he was involved in the disappearances themselves, but they're confident one of the many people involved in the scheme will throw everyone else under the bus to save their own skin. The night that I had unexpectedly seen Paul in action, they were in the process of retrieving some rare artwork Frank Robinson had been keeping in the garage. The group who had no idea that Frank Robinson, who as it turns out hasn't been seen since he left town, had that stuff hidden away in the basement. They were too busy with the priceless paintings they knew Robinson had hidden away and a disused freezer in the garage, which are much easier and less dangerous to sell than the stuff in the basement. I guess the old saying is really true. It takes a thief to catch a thief.